Well, today we come to the glory of the Lord. Wow, what to make of it. This week, uh, NASA, amount, uh, NASA announced that in the next 20 years, they expect to find in the Milky Way in our galaxy a planet that sustains alien life. Matt Mountain, the director of the Webb Telescope, uh, sorry, the Space Telescope Science Institute, he said this this week. He said, just imagine the moment when we find potential signatures of life. Imagine the moment when the world wakes up and the human race realises that its long loneliness in time and space may be over. The possibility that we're not alone in the universe. Now, I find that quite interesting. It's quite a claim to make that we're going to find life on another planet in the next 20 years. And I find it interesting that he speaks in the terms of potential and possibility. He can't actually pin it down to something. And what I found even more interesting about what he said was that it seems to be coming, our search seems to be coming from a loneliness that humanity has in the universe. He says, imagine the moment when the world wakes up and the human race realises its long loneliness in space and time may be over. Something else that happened this week you might have read about. A man killed himself in a ceremonial fire at Utah uh, at the Element 11 festival. I don't know whether you heard about that or not. It's an interesting festival. What they do is they go and they build these huge 30, 40 foot structures out of timber, old pallets and stuff like that, artworks, and then they set them on fire and they watch them burn down. It's quite spectacular to watch. Anyhow, this guy broke through the crowd, ran out and threw himself into the flames and was killed. And one of the witnesses said he was astonished to see it happened, that this man died alone while he was surrounded by people who cared. And then just on Friday I read this, that apparently February next year, the first android, the first companionship robot will be released for sale. And in the not too distant future, we will be developing interpersonal relationships with machines. I think it's already sort of begun. The Terminators are here. There seems to be a deep sense of loneliness in our society. I'm sure it's true for each of us here that we've experienced some form of loneliness. That moment where you feel you're lost in a crowd. When you come home to an empty house. Or that longing for friendship and for companionship. And I believe that we, we have this sense of loneliness because it stems from an even deeper, a deeper feeling, the feelings of abandonment and rejection. Now, why, why are we so dissatisfied with life here that we're looking to escape to it in another world? How is it that a person can stand in a crowd of people and think that their only option is to throw themselves into the flames? And why are we developing relationships with machines and not with real people who are all around us? Well, I believe it's because of this. I believe it's because God has built us, he's made us, he's designed us to be in the ultimate relationship. The ultimate relationship with him and with his people through fellowship. And today as we come to Ezekiel... We're confronted by the glory of God, the transcendent, eternal, indescribable, I'll even go unknowable God. But we are comforted also because we find that this great almighty transcendent God has made himself known, has reached down into history through his word and through his son and through his spirit so that we might know him and come into the most ultimate relationship we could ever imagine. And so as we turn our minds to Ezekiel, let me pray for us that God will just reignite 
our minds to understand his glory again. Let me pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come before you now. We know that you are seated and throned on high, that you rule over all things by your great power and might. But Father, sometimes that seems very distant from us. And so today, Lord, we pray that as we come to your word, you would just refresh and renew our vision of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to find that Ezekiel is a very colourful book. It's got some interesting stuff in there. So who's Ezekiel? Well, Ezekiel was a priest, but he couldn't serve as a priest because the people were in exile. And so God calls him to be a prophet. We read about that the first couple of verses. Israel's been exiled to Babylon because of their disobedience to God. They haven't been faithful to him. They have sinned against him. And so now they're bearing the consequences of their actions. And they must have had this deep feeling of loss, of abandonment, of loneliness, as they looked back to the former glory days of King David and King Solomon, to the Golden Age. And now where were they? Exiled, uprooted and sent into Babylon. We hear that Ezekiel is 30 years old, if that's verse 1, is ripe just to go into the priesthood. And we find that there's been five years that the exile, the Jews have been exiled when this vision of God and the word of the Lord comes to him. And he sees this indescribable vision of God, the transcend, transcended God, high and exalted on a chariot, chariot throne. And right throughout the description, Ezekiel struggles to even describe this. You know, 22 times just in this chapter, he can't put his finger on it. He says the glory of God is like, it was the likeness of. He just can't put his finger on it and say, look, if you look at that, that's what the glory of God is like. And I don't know about you, but as I read these chapters this week, now I found my mind and my imagination was just set on fire. And I was excited, excited to read as I tried to comprehend what was being written here about God. And I came away and I was so thankful that the Bible doesn't have pictures in it. So glad. And glad that God's given me an imagination that I can read his word and then colour in the details and stand in awe and wonder of his being and his character. An excited mind and spirit about who he is. I guess it's why the book's always better than the movie. Have you ever noticed that? The book's always better than the movie. Why is the book always better than the movie? Because the book allows your imagination to colour in the details. And whatever you do, don't do this. Don't go home and Google Ezekiel 1's vision. Okay? You'll be sadly disappointed just to let your imagination go. I've made that mistake, so I've been praying really hard. And if you've made that mistake... Pray really hard that God gives you a fresh vision of his glory, his magnificence and his excellence. Well, what does Ezekiel tell us about the glory of God? Well, look at verse 4 with me and what does he give us? The classic God shot, doesn't he? He says, I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. The centre of the, the, the centre of the fire looked like glowing metal. And so here we have it, the classic God shot, don't we? There's the bright orb of the sun glowing like freshly forged steel. It's shrouded in thick clouds of darkness with beams of light and bolts of lightning blasting out from underneath. You know the image that I'm talking about, don't you? We see them on countless calendars, uh, Christian motivationals, internet memes, even... Well, not today, but even PowerPoint presentations and so on. It's a representation of the glory of God. And when we look at these things, it tends to give us a bit of a warm and fuzzy feeling about who God is and his power and his glory. But in reality, all it does is it plasticates the glory of God because we miss the fuller impact of the glory of God. We never get to see or experience the full experience of God's glory. And I tell you, if you read Ezekiel and if you read Daniel and if you read about Peter, John and James who did experience the glory of God, it wasn't warm and fuzzy. They came away deeply 
disturbed and in anguish. But from this classic God shot that we're given here, Ezekiel looks and the vision is expanded. Expanded into this fantastic otherworldly creatures. Now I'll admit it, I've got a thing for dragons. I really like dragons. But these seraphim, these angels, these, these bearers of God's throne are incredible, amazing things. What, how do you make sense of them? What do we notice about these creatures is there's, there's really nothing that we can compare them to. And so Ezekiel, again, he describes them as being like. He says they're kind of like human in appearance. They've got human hands. I guess they stood upright in a way. Yet they've got four faces and four wings. What does this mean? Well, four, perfection, symmetry, four wings. Two of those wings, they touched each other as they flapped. They have purpose and single-mindedness in their service to God. And they cover themselves with the other two in humility and submission to God. If we think about the four faces, the four faces point outwards like the compass. They see the whole world. And they're made up of those creatures that would be considered the highest in the creation, starting with humanity, the man, man made in God's image, and then going down to the lion and the bull and the eagle. Notice the animals that aren't there. Why are there no sea creatures there? Well, probably because of this. To the Jews, the ocean was considered as a place of chaos. And so we see that there's no chaos here in the servants of God at God's throne. We also find that they're in sync with each other and they're in sync with God. Verse 12 tells us that they act only in accordance with the Spirit. They only move when the Spirit moves and they had unity within themselves as they manoeuvre the chariot of God. And lastly, we see that they are endowed with the flames of holiness. They burn as if they're burning coals or a flaming torch. And this flame, this fire, being associated with the holiness of God's presence. And the purpose of these, these creatures, I imagine them lifting God's throne up on their shoulder... And trotting along, you know the image, but that's a really bad image because they're even greater than this. They're God's throne bearers. And this is what I find really amazing about God's throne, is that it moves. If you think about a throne, a throne is normally set in place, isn't it? And that is where the king presides and rules over his domain. And if we think about the region at the time, what did they have? They had what they called their local gods. You know, they had a god of the, the river and they had a god of the sky and a god of the grass and a god of the, the this and a god of the that. They had their local gods. And yet in stark contrast, we see that the God of Israel is not located, he's not confined, he's not truncated to one place. He is the God of all creation, sovereign over the whole earth. And then Ezekiel sees the wheels. I like wheels. A nice set of mag wheels on a car is great. But God see, we see God's wheels here. And what do we learn about God's wheels? They're multidimensional. They have the ability to travel in any direction. Forwards, backwards, left, right, up and down. What does this tell us? It points to the ubiquity, the omnipresence, the the ever-present, the always-presence of God in all space and all time and all history. We see these wheels are high and awesome, immense and beyond comprehension. They have to be. These are the wheels of God's chariot. And then it gets bizarre. They're covered in eyes all over. What does this symbolise? The omniscience of God, that he sees all, that he knows all, and that nothing escapes his gaze. And we see that the creatures and the wheels work in perfect unison together and power. They sound like rushing water standing next to a waterfall or like the voice of the Almighty himself. And again, here we see the omnipotence of God, his almightiness, his power, his unmatchedness, his, him being unequal to anything else in the world. And then from here, 
the vision goes even higher. And we look and we see an expanse is described, sparkling like ice. I imagine kind of like the sun shimmering on the river. You know, when you drive out to, to Yamba, you drive along the river and you see the sparkles. But then I have to imagine that it's a million times, a bazillion times, an infinite time better than that. And what does this expanse point us to? The further transcendence of God. It is far above the angels and this throne. For the angels and the throne are the created things. But God is the creator. Far superior than anything we could ever conceive or imagine. And so Ezekiel looks and what does he see? He sees this throne of sapphire, the very best, above the expanse. And on the throne he sees a figure, a figure in appearance as a man. And I find this astonishing. Because what do we see here? This is kind of a reversal of the creation. Humanity was made in God's image. God's not made in man's image. And yet here we see that God appears in the form of a man. He appears in his transcendence as one whom we can identify with and one whom we can relate to. And we see that this, this, this God-man figure, he blazes with the fire of holiness. Look at verse 27. I saw from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as full of fire. And then from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. Remember that God's appearance is usually associated with fire. Think about Moses, when he was called to go to Israel. How did God appear? In fire, a burning bush. When God led his people out of Israel, uh, out of uh, Egypt, how did he appear? In a pillar of fire. We've just learnt recently that God made a covenant with Abram and what passed between the two, two parts of the animals? A smoking fire pot and a burning torch. Think about when God appeared to his people at Sinai. How did he appear? In a lightning storm and with fire. And how did God appear when he came? At Pentecost in the Holy Spirit, with tongues of fire. And so we see that fire is associated with the presence of God and of his holiness. And yet we also see in his appearance is brilliant, it's radiant, it's the light of righteousness. It is the light of God who reveals the way. And we see that this light in verse 28 is in the appearance of a rainbow, and what does the rainbow point us to? The covenant faithfulness of God to his people. That he will be their God and they will be his people. And so what do we see here in Ezekiel's vision? We see the glory of God Almighty, transcendent, eternal, a being who is beyond all comprehension and yet he is imminent and real. And down to earth. He is a God who has reached down from on high and into the lives of his people so that they might find salvation. For where do we find God? He's not in Israel, he's in exile with his people in Babylon. We see him imminently involved with his people, still seeking that they would come back to him. And it's the same for us. People in the world are in a state of exile because of our rejection of God. The Bible calls this sin. You can be in outright opposition to God, but I think it's even worse when our rejection of God stems from complacency. And however, we see that the transcendent God he came down to earth in commitment to our salvation. It was so important that God, this man figure, put aside his glory and came into the world. A 
love the way that the writer of the Hebrews puts it. He says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various different ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he's appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And then he goes on to say this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. To look to Jesus is to see the fullest revelation of God's glory. Jesus Christ is the glory of God personified. And that person came in to the grit and the grime of this world. He set aside his glory, set aside his majesty, and committed himself to you, to you and to I and to your salvation. That he would never leave you, he would never forsake you. But as we've been learning, because of God's covenant faithfulness, God is 100% committed to being your God so that you might be his people. Now, Jesus Christ, risen again, ascended, sits at the right hand of God Almighty. He has been exalted to the highest place. He has been given the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, how do we respond to the glory of God? There's only one response. We have a God and a King who is high and mighty and yet he is down to earth. And the glory of God calls each and every one of us into a deeper, more personal relationship with him. And so if you haven't come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, if you haven't come to a relationship with him, today God calls you from his righteousness and from his glory to come into relationship with him. Start the most ultimate relationship in your entire life. Stop being lonely. And if you do know him, what's our response? To have a warm and fuzzy at the shot of a sun behind the clouds? No. Our response should be to fall in our face. Fall in our face before God in awe of his glory and of his majesty and of his power and of his might. Or that this transcendent God would reach down into history and come into this world as the person of Jesus Christ so that we might know him. And then rise, rise in joy and in comfort that the eternal God is imminent, personally involved in your life, drawing you nearer to him through all the circumstances of life so that you might draw near to him in faith and in trust and in obedience. And so let me pray for us now that this week God makes that a reality. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we fall before you. We fall before you in awe and in wonder, in humility. We are struck by your greatness and by your majesty, by your power, by your transcendence. Father, we are struck by you because you, being so great and high, have come down so low. Low into our world, low into our lives, so that you might raise us up to be your people. Father, there are many of us here. We struggle with your glory. I'm one of them. Help us, Father, to have a new and a fresh vision of your greatness and of your power so that it would play out practically in our lives as we love each other, 
as we love our families, as we love our wives and our children, our mothers and our fathers, and all those around us, as we love the community about us as well. Give us a fresh vision of you and of your power and how nothing is impossible for you. And Father, I pray for those who don't have this vision at all. Father, by your spirit, change, transform their hearts, draw them to you and save them. In Jesus' name. Amen.